Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. When we think of Georgetown University and the Catholic faith and Jesuit priests, we don't usually think of the slave trade, the buying and selling of black men, women, and children in America. But that's just what Rachel Swarns confronts us with in a big page one story in the Sunday New York Times. Georgetown and other American universities were deeply involved in the slave trade. And Ms. Swarns, a columnist with the Times, is here to talk about this with us. Rachel, welcome. Thanks for coming in. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So um, this is a remarkable article, and you opened it by describing one particular sale. And you wrote, this was no ordinary slave sale. The enslaved African Americans had belonged to the nation's most prominent Jesuit priests. So tell us about that sale. So I was writing about the sale of 272 enslaved African Americans who were sold by the Jesuits in 1838. And they were sold in part to help save uh, the biggest educational project that the Jesuits had at the time, which was Georgetown. Right. So this was uh, just sort of, uh, it was a big sale, but it was just business as usual, this involvement in the slave trade. So before the, the slaves were sold, what, was their, what, what were their tasks? What did they do? You don't usually think of universities as holding slaves. Well, it was a little bit, it was a step removed. So the Jesuits owned the slaves. It was the Maryland province of the Jesuits that owned the slaves. And they had owned the slaves for decades. Um, and they, the slaves worked on plantations in Maryland. And the operations of the plantations, the, the labor of the plantations, helped support Georgetown and, and did so for years. Um, and they farmed tobacco, wheat, um, that kind of thing. And in the 1830s, the plantations were becoming increasingly inefficient. And the, the Jesuit priests started looking for other ways to keep the college afloat. So this was a way of raising cash. That's what it was. So you said um, the sale, well, the sale, as we would expect, was horrible. And the reports of witnesses and others said that children were uh, separated uh, from their parents. And some of the slaves actually had to be dragged, sort of kicking and screaming, to the ships which were going to take them to other ports in the United States. Um, and when I was reading that, I was thinking, you know, there's this terrible but persistent myth in the United States that um, slaves, or at least a lot of the slaves, were uh, well off. They might even have been uh, happy that there were these benevolent masters and that sort of thing. And here we have just this sort of treatment even at a Catholic university and at the hands of or at the direction of Jesuit um, priests. And my question really is, what's your response to this myth that there was something or anything benevolent about slavery? You know, it's an interesting question. And, you know, the Catholic Church at the time did not view slavery as immoral. Um, as immoral. As immoral. Right. It, they did not. Um, and so, you know, there are reports from visiting priests um, coming from, you know, the 1820s, for instance, where they describe whippings of pregnant women. They describe um, shelter, housing that was virtually inhabitable, um, not enough to eat. Um, those conditions improved over time, in part because of the reports um, that came back uh, from visitors who went. Um, but uh, this slave sale in 1838 was the biggest, but it was not the first by far. So families were split up. This, this was not benign or benevolent. Right. Um, you really captured the human element of this particular um, sale. You said the, ens the enslaved were grandmothers and grandfathers, carpenters and blacksmiths, pregnant women and anxious fathers, children and infants. These are the people who were sold specifically in that Georgetown sale. Um, it strikes me that when you're covering something like this, and this is a, a, a big article, it's, it's a long piece, um, that you experience emotions yourself as you're covering this sort of thing. What were some of the things, the thoughts or the feelings that um, you experienced? You know, uh, this, this story came about because there was an effort by both the university and, alum and alumni one uh, alumnus in particular, Richard Cellini, uh, a technology executive, 
to track down the descendants of uh, the slaves who were sold. It's the first time um, that anyone affiliated with the university has really tried to do that. And so, uh, to me, the most compelling uh, thing was uh, to try, uh, as a writer, in the best way that I could, to tell the story of these people which had been lost. Um, and as an African American and as a Catholic, um, you know, reading some of this is, you know, it's, it's, it's heavy stuff. There's no way around it. Um, the Jesuits uh, kept very good records, and because of that, the names of these people have been in the archives for decades. Um, we, are, we benefit from modern technology uh, so that now a lot of these records, like the ship manifest, which lists the full names of the individuals, some of them who were sold, their ages, their height, um, are available to us. And so these people um, uh, come to life um, in a way that they had not before. And I think that's what people are hoping to do, you know, to bring their stories to life and also to make it very clear that um, many of our institutions have their roots uh, in this period and, and benefited from this trade. One of the things that w was um, interesting in the article was that <laughs> The slaves had been baptized and, and, and they were Catholics and they were made to attend mass. Uh, and at the same time, they could be uh, whipped for whatever infractions, uh, severely punished if they tried to escape. You must have been struck by the irony of this. There are a lot of contradictions. I mean, it's interesting. They did have a, a kind of code. I mean, it wasn't slaveholding, wasn't immoral, but there was a kind of code and there was there was debate and, and some anguish about this sale. It was not... At, at Georgetown. At, at, yeah, among the Jesuits, yeah. yeah there, it was not an easy decision. Um, and um, the head of the Jesuits only agreed under certain conditions. He said the family should not be separated, uh, the money should not go to pay debts, um, that there should be provisions made to ensure that the slaves could continue practicing their faith. And the university says none of those conditions were met. The we money, met. The, yeah, much of the money was used to pay the debts uh, at Georgetown. Families were split up, and uh, but there was so there was an effort though uh, by the Jesuits to to try and um, minister um, to the slaves. They they viewed these people as people with souls. At the same time, they also viewed them as people who could be enslaved. It's hard for us in contemporary times right. to make uh, much sense of that, but that's, that's how they viewed it. Did you come across any evidence that anyone, any of the Jesuits or people affiliated with them, felt that slavery was wrong? Oh yes, absolutely. And in fact, uh, I mentioned in the article that some people were dragged off to the ship um, there was a decision to take them for sale, to take them to the ships, uh, you know, to come by surprise to, with no announcement because there was concern that the priests who actually worked on the plantation might encourage people to run away. And in fact, they did. I mean, in subsequent visits, they let slaves know and, and, and some did escape. Wow. You mentioned that there's been this effort at Georgetown to try and track, I guess, the descendants of, of some of these slaves at least how specifically did you get involved in the story? What made you want to do it, and how did you come to make all the necessary contacts? You know, we, the alum who I mentioned, uh, Richard Cellini, uh, got in touch with a colleague of mine who said, who passed it on to me, and I was immediately really interested. So I uh, went to Baton Rouge and to uh, Iberville Parish, where uh, the genealogist had identified uh, one of the descendants. And um, that was Maxine Crump. And it was her great, great grandfather who I write about, Cornelius Hawkins, right. who was only about 13 years old when he was sold and sent to Louisiana. So this was a child. He was a child, yeah. And uh, for Maxine Crump, uh, who's 69, uh, retired television anchor, uh, who grew up in a Catholic family, this was staggering. All right, she, <laughs> she didn't know about this. No idea. Who told her? 
Um, well, it was Richard Cellini, the, the Georgetown alum, who called her up and said, by the way, you know, we've done some research and this is what we found. She was driving in her hometown and, um, So you she's know, on the cell phone in her car? That's exactly guy, right. That's exactly <laughs> this guy right. Calls, calls up. her up. Right. And she, it explained a number of things, you know, the origins of the Catholicism in her family, though right. the origins were very painful. Um, but it was interesting, she, the name Cornelius was a family name, and um, she also discovered the origins of that, and that was something, too. So his name was Cornelius Hawkins. He had the nickname... Neely. Neely. That's right. And you wrote that um, not only was the family still Catholic, yep. but there were people who were named... That's right. The, the, the name carried across the generations. The name so Cornelius she, the name carried Cornelius across the... was a familiar family name to her. And, and, and now she knows where it came from. So they had no idea why no the family idea. was Catholic. They just were right, Catholic. They just were Catholic. All right. So what was her reaction? She said she felt a mix of reactions, you know, outrage at the church leaders for having condoned this and at Georgetown for have benefited, you know, from the sale of her ancestors. But, you know, there's also some joy there because, you know, this was information she didn't have. And for so many African-Americans, it's so difficult to right. trace back uh, to slavery um, that being able to know who these people were and something of their story was and still is immensely important to her. You wrote that at uh, Georgetown, um, slavery and scholarship are inextricably linked. What did you mean by that? I meant that the, the profits of the slave labor helped fund the administration and operations of the school. The two early presidents, two early presidents of the school were intimately involved with the sale, even produce. Um, at the uh, from the farms went to the the college to help feed the folks the students there I mean there was a direct connection right it's almost as if without slavery you wouldn't have had um, at least in the early stages of the university it was and, and the sale really was an important part to keeping it afloat so now you've mentioned um, this alum uh, Richard Cellini is how That's you pronounce right. it um, how did he become involved and, and what's his interest what's he what's he trying to do he's an interesting guy you know he's a white guy uh, a graduate of Georgetown Law School, a practicing Catholic, who's never been involved in issues like this before. Um, but when students were demonstrating, and they were demonstrating at Georgetown because Georgetown had two buildings named after the college presidents who were involved in the slave sale, um, the students were successful in getting the buildings renamed. These are the priests, two of the priests. That's right, who are also presidents at the university. So they're responsible for this they sale. Were involved, right that's about. right. Okay, so there's two buildings. That were named for them. Okay. And um, he watched the protests and, and started thinking, wow, is that all we're, we're going to do here? What, what about those are buildings? What about the people? We know they have names. Uh, no one has ever tracked them down. How, how has that happened? And he got uh, really passionate about this and hired, uh, created a nonprofit, raised money, hired about eight genealogists, and is steadily at work uh, trying to find descendants and prodding the university to take action. Now, the university, even before the protests in the fall, had set up a working group on slavery to wrestle with these issues. And they are. They are thinking about, um, you know, putting together a memorial to the slaves, um, perhaps setting up scholarships for descendants, perhaps formally apologizing uh, for profiting from slave labor. Were the names of these priests taken off of those buildings? They were. And are there still protests um, going on from students? No, not at this point. So this process is on. So this working group is going to be meeting and uh, we're expecting some recommendations from them in the coming months. Right. Um, Mr. Cellini's efforts to track some of these other descendants, um, has that borne fruit? Yeah, you know, it's, it's painstaking work and it's difficult, um, but they have identified a handful of people and they are continuing to search. Now this begs the entire question of uh, reparations. Georgetown is trying to figure out what it ought to do. Um, but when you look at um, the entire history of slavery and then the subsequent history of the United States and what's happened with African Americans in this um, country, a lot of people think that 
reparations is too big, too tough, too controversial, too complicated an issue even to deal with, and, and, they and, and they turn away. But if you were talking to young people just on the idea of how um, should you or might you approach the issue of reparations, if you have an open mind and you're trying to figure out how do I feel about this, um, what kind of suggestions would you give them? You know, this is a tough, tough question. Um, you know, our editorial board uh, came out this weekend saying that uh, Georgetown really needs to do something uh, significant here more than just apologize. And, you know, we got a lot of comments uh, from readers saying, you know, this is old history, long gone, right. forget it. Um, but, you know, Richard Cellini, the alum who got involved with this, says, you know, um, we at Georgetown have preferences and for all kinds of people. Uh, for legacy folks, we, we admit them, we offer special privileges. He says, as an alum, I get, you know, uh, car rental discounts. This school might not be here if it was not for right. these people. Uh, you know, how could we not do more? Now, this is an, an issue. Uh, in, in and it's not just Georgetown, obviously. You're, you're oh, right. You know, a lot of, a lot of institutions have, uh, more than a dozen have um, acknowledged their ties to slavery and the slave trade. And, um, you know, so this is an issue that is, um, is alive and, and people are really wrestling with. And you mentioned the um, mixed emotions of Maxine Crump when she found out. That's about right. her, how many greats was it? Great, Two greats. Great, <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Great, yeah. great um, grandfather. Actually, um, so there was a photo uh, with your article of her visiting a gravesite. So the gravesite is actually there. That's right. And, and so, she didn't, and but she, she didn't, didn't know. know. So uh, the genealogist had, uh, you know, in the records, had found where she thought Cornelius Hawkins was buried. And she told Maxine Crump, I think he's buried in this cemetery. And Maxine said, oh, I know exactly where that is. It's her family cemetery. It's the only cemetery in the town uh, where she grew up. And he had been buried there all along. And uh, she had no idea. Wow. Yeah. So you mentioned her mixed reactions when she found out about this. And you wrote a fascinating book a few years ago, American Tapestry, the story of the black, white, and multiracial ancestors of Michelle Obama, and one of the things that struck me was um, Michelle Obama has said, she's talked extensively about her family and her roots, um, but she said when it came to slavery, even though there were slaves in the family, as there are in nearly every right. African American That's in right. this country, the family didn't really talk about that or hardly ever talked about that. That's right. And it strikes me that that's similar for a lot of it black is. families in this, in this country. It is, I think there's, um this sense of shame. We, we're blaming the victims even though we are the victims. There's yeah. a sense of, I, I think, uh, for our elders of wanting to move forward and not looking back. But I think it's so important for us to look back. Um, and I think not just for African Americans, but for all of us as Americans. Uh, this history is hard history. It is difficult. It is painful. It is our history, though. And I think we have to grapple with it. So uh, rather than turn away, it should be confronted. Should be confronted. And what do you think comes of confronting it? If you confront it honestly and you learn about your history, what are the benefits um, that result from that? Um, I think, you know, there's more of an understanding that, um, you know, Georgetown might not be the elite university that it was without uh, this slave sale. Um, and, and I think it connects, you know, I think there is at times a sense um, among some people that you know, oh, you know, you keep complaining about all of that stuff in yeah. the past. <laughs> Don't <laughs> let complain, it go. let it go. But um, it is so inextricably linked to um, where we are today. And I think it would be helpful if we, if we all as a nation knew that and understood that and could see that. And what I think was powerful about um, the Georgetown story um, is, again, um, the, uh, the specificity of it 
how concrete it was. These records are there. They are people with names. There are dollar figures. There is an institution that we can see today. And I think that's really powerful in connecting us to that period. You know, you mentioned how it's slavery, the slave trade, and all that came after um, that was linked to it is just absolutely woven into nearly every aspect of our yes. existence. So you're talking about Georgetown, one of America's elite um, universities. In your book, you're talking about the first lady of That's the right. United States, but we're also talking about ancestors of yours and of mine. I mean, it is everywhere. And yet there is this uh, one, it's uncomfortable it for uncomfortable. most people. That's who, right who talk about it. And there's this desire on, on a lot of people to just turn, turn away. The irony that slavery and all the elements and ramifications of slavery are not properly taught in our schools is really peculiar um, to me. But do you have a sense of whether we're doing any better at that than we were, say, 20 years ago or 30 years ago? You know, I don't know. Um, I, I we don't hear we I don't think, hear much about. It. I, I think we're doing better. I have I have a nine year old, um, and I think he's learning more than I did. We'll have Harriet Tubman on uh, on our U.S. currency, and and that will be uh, you know a vivid reminder. Right. You know, I I like to think that we're doing better. I think you know it's not easy though, and I think. Um, I think we have to do more. When you wrote the book about Michelle Obama's um, ancestors, um, what, what drew you to that project? And tell us a little bit about what you gained from actually doing all that research. What's, what surprised you? What, did, what didn't you know? What hadn't you known? You know, that it, it emerged out of an article I did about her ancestors, her great, great, great grandmother, who was a slave girl in Georgia. Uh, in the 1850s and her great-great-great-grandfather who was a white man whose identity was a mystery. Through DNA testing I was able to solve the mystery and identify that You family. solved the mystery and, and Michelle I Obama did, didn't know? I did. But what really um, intrigued me was that her story was so much of America's story and what I loved was that these people were not famous people, they were regular people who were you know doing the best they could and um, and following her line um, from slavery to the White House was a real history lesson in a lot of ways. And, and for me, you know, it really um, inspired me to do more digging into my own uh, family tree. And, uh, you know, that's a perennial uh, project that I've got, you know, <laughs> boxes and boxes and stacks of paper. Uh, but it's, it's, it's really fascinating. It tells us a lot about ourselves. Well, I want to thank you for coming in, my former colleague and good friend, thank Rachel you. Swarns. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. We've been hearing mostly good news about the job market lately. The unemployment rate is hovering around 5%, and some of the jobless men and women who had become discouraged and stopped looking for work are now creeping back into the job market. But there are still major concerns. For a variety of reasons, many of the people who are, in fact, unemployed are not counted as unemployed by the Labor Department. The true unemployment rate is somewhat higher than the official rate of 5%. And some groups are still having a really tough time. The unemployment rate for African Americans is roughly twice that of whites. For high school graduates under the age of 30, the jobless rate is nearly 18%, according to the Economic Policy Institute. And that's not counting the so-called underemployed, those who are working part-time, for example, but would prefer a full-time job. It's important to remember that the vast majority of young Americans, two-thirds, do not have a college degree. And many of those who do have a degree are working at jobs like flipping burgers or delivering pizzas that don't require that level of education. We should keep the good economic news in perspective. The Great Recession and the long, difficult recovery from it, which we're still experiencing, has been the worst economic period in America 
since the Great Depression of the 1930s, more than 70 years ago. This is no time to break out the champagne. That's all for now. See you next time.